She saw color <clears throat> more vibrantly than most of us do from you know the way she would talk about it and so forth. Sometimes she would point to a shadow and say, do you see the blues and the violets there? Aren't they beautiful? And I'd look down and see gray or maybe tan or something, you know, and then after a while, I could make myself see blue and violet. But I, you know, that's sort of the psychological aspect of, of vision as well. If, if, you're, if someone's telling you that it's there, eventually you, you do see it or you believe it. Dr. Dunn was curator at the Brockton Art Museum, now the Fuller Craft Museum, from 1973 to 76. It was there where he first met Terry Priest, and they were friends for then on, a period of over 40 years. Uh, I hope, um, you know, tonight will be a nice trip through memory lane for those of you who knew her work. Um, if not, uh, an introduction to um, sort of the vast and varied output of this remarkable artist. Now, featured within the gallery is uh, this work, Static Variations, Blue Times Two. Um, I'll come back to that later. Um, I heard, I kind of overheard somebody saying, well, he'll explain what it means. Uh, I hope to offer some insights. Um, but with Terry, it was always, the, the viewer was interactive with the work. Now, Terry was um, a person who was always balancing her art. She always made time for her art, uh, but she was always involved in other things. She was, of course, a wife and mother. Um, she was active in the community. She became very active during the civil, right, civil rights movement, um, of course, supporting the cause of the civil rights movement. And um, she was a teacher, teacher here at the Worcester Art Museum, and also, uh, from 1978 into, I think it was 1991, uh, taught at um, the College of the Holy Cross, where for a while she was also chairing the department. So she had a lot of demands upon her. Um, later, from 1991 through 12 years thereafter, uh, she had a partnership with Alan Fletcher, the Fletcher Priest Gallery, which some of you know, um, and perhaps visited during that time. Uh, I think that too showed another aspect of her involvement in art because she was a great supporter of other artists. When I first met her and she invited me to her studio, she also made sure that I visited the studios of two other artists in Worcester. Uh, that was when I was, was curator. Uh, here we have a news clipping. Um, already she was getting attention back in, what, 1962. Uh, from the local press and uh, shows her with her two sons. I never knew that Joseph was once called Jed. Uh, he's the younger of the two and then Michael. And Michael's here tonight and I want to thank him for helping me gather the information for this talk and some of the images. Uh, he still looks pretty much like that and he still has a, <laughs> and he still has a dog. So. <laughs> no air. <laughs> I don't know if you had that much then. <laughs> well, yes, you did. Now, um, Terry's early work, and I really don't have any to show you except for Michael's portrait, uh, was representational. That's how she was trained. She was um, very good as a figure painter, and eventually we'll see at the end of her career, she returns to figure painting. Uh, but by 1960, she's moving into uh, abstraction, or what we call in the art field, non-objective work, meaning that there's no object or no subject matter involved. And uh, so this is one of the early ones. And notice the title, uh, Orient II. Now, a lot of what I say are my interpretations or things that you know, um, I heard Terry talking about in our conversations. Uh, but for me, Orient means a new direction. Um, Orient has to do with direction and also has to do with a, a new exotic place. Uh, so I, to me, that's what the titles mean. Uh, here she's painting rather loosely, a painting that emphasizes sort of verticality. She's involved in color. Terry's always involved in color. Um, and here the colors refer to nature, um, sky, sea, and the earth with its vegetation. Uh, but then by, actually by 1961, 
uh, she moves into these, what we call a kind of hard edge technique um, in which the, the lines are very crisply drawn. Uh, there's no sense of a gesture by the artist. And in fact, um, in Terry's work, um, the surface is always smooth. Uh, she was not interested in having the paint strokes visible. Um, she began with a very smooth surface to begin with, one that was sanded down. Um, the layers of gesso were sanded down. Uh, but then her own work emphasized a smoothness too. She got into these, um, these works in 1961. Now they became associated with optical art or op art, which became quite a, a famous art movement in the early 1960s, uh, but the term itself was not coined until 1964. She was already working in that, um, that style by 1961. And also, um, the sort of the formation of the movement, the first sort of public um, display of op art occurred in 1965, which was at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and it was a exhibition titled The Responsive Eye, because what our op art is about is uh, the way the eye sees. What we see that's there and what we see that isn't there. Um, in other words, um, perception and illusion together. Because with these works, if you look at them long enough, and that's the intent, and usually they're very large to fill your field of vision. You know, you're supposed to stand up close enough so that they, they um, sort of fill the, the span of space that you're looking at. Uh, that way they work the best. And all, thing, all kinds of things can happen. Uh, you get senses of movement, vibration eventually, um, spatial illusions, some forms appearing to emerge in front of others, um, and then also color vibrations, colors that appear. It's a, it's um, a physiological thing that has to do with the fatigue of the, what, the rods and cones of your, your eyes uh, that eventually will um, make you perceive things that aren't there. Um, and I think you know, that's an exploration, too, of the fugitive nature of what, what we think of as reality. Uh, I'm sure that was very much what she was involved in as well. And um, sometimes we see things that aren't there, um, or we're missing things that are there. Uh, by the way, yeah, here it's, I, <coughs> it's indicated that she did these freehand. Uh, a lot of the hard edge painters were using masking tape. That's pretty well known. Um, Mondrian, by the way, when he came to the United States during World War II, um, he fell in love with our nation for several reasons. He loved jazz, he loved the grid layout of New York, um, but he loved the fact that he discovered masking tape that was here. <laughs> so, but Terry did not use that. This is freehand work. Now also the dimensions. She's very interested in the differing dimensions of these stripes, and that helps to create some kind, sometimes the vibration, maybe if you're seeing it now, um, or the sense of spatial depth relationships that occur. Um, she did sell a work to a, a couple, and it was returned because the man said he got headaches whenever he looked at it. <laughs> so um, here we have one. By the way, these are called the Organic Interactions. This, she did a whole series with that title. And um, what would be organic about this? Um, in fact, it's the viewer. The viewer is the organic element because there's nothing that suggests nature within the image itself. Uh, but it has to do with the interaction of the viewer with the work and for each of us, that experience is going to be different. I think maybe, you know, even, even in the, these slides, you might get some of the effect, but that's always best achieved um, in front of the actual work. I did this, photographed this detail just to give a sense of how precise these lines are done. 
you know, here, if you look at it long enough, you begin to get a kind of swirled effect and also a spatial, for me anyway, a spatial thing where the, the central triangle with its thicker line seemed to come forward of these other triangular sections and then the upper ones have yellow stripes rather than the white. Uh, I mentioned that she was very active in the civil rights movement. Um, that involved uh, contacts with Abby Hoffman even. And, um, you know, she started doing these as a response to the civil rights movement and people were saying, well, if you're, you know, if you're trying to do art that relates to that, why don't you do some paintings of some of the demonstrations or, or some of the, the beatings that are going on um, for those who are marching and that sort of thing. But um, she wanted it, I'm sure, to be more universal than that. This is a work that's somewhat related to the museum's piece, the, uh, the one in Worcester. Now, for me, um, uh, some things happen. We'll talk about it with, uh, you know, the, the one that um, the museum has. Uh, but this blue field here um, appears to come forward. Of course, I start getting the vibration of the black and white lines that suggest movement as well. And then looking at it long enough, you start to see colors. Now, uh, many of these are multi-panel. They were intended to be arranged in different ways. Um, it could be arranged as two vertical panels, for example, or this one could be on the other side as though this um, tenon would fit into this mortise almost in a carpenter's sense. Uh, <clears throat> but um, that was something that, that Terry realized, uh, actually uh, endorsed in these paintings. So for example, this one, you have the two arrows. Uh, they are joining together here. Arrows suggest direction. Um, to me, this is almost like a yin and yang thing of opposing forces, one going one way, one going the other, but, but meeting together. Certainly that um, says something in terms of you know, these oppositions during the civil rights movement possibly finding a unity together. Now, I hadn't noticed it before until I looked at the painting again. Um, I had always just assumed these were white and black lines. They aren't. If you look closely, uh, the white's not a true white. It's kind of a gray. And these are actually brown. They're very dark brown lines. Um, in other words, she seems to be saying that people really are not either white or black. No one's really pure white or pure black. We're, you know, all kinds of different colors, different shades in between. Now, um, the joining together suggests the unity that's possible in this particular case. Um, it's a kind of like a yin-yang um, where opposites come together. Opposites can be in conflict or they can be complementary to each other as they are with yin and yang. Here the stripes are black and white, um, but there is kind of a gash, you might say, that she has created uh, with a yellow element here. The, the other yellow is just the wall. Um, but in the actual work, as you look at it, um, you start, your eye starts to complete these squares which are interrupted by the yellow. Very interesting. And then, of course, the yellow, as you're starting to see, you know, with the black and white stimulus, and you're starting to see other colors, the yellow um, begins to affect that viewing of the other colors. Now, Terry worked on these. These are her largest works, actually. Um, some of them very large, not all of them. Uh, but some of them are extremely large, many panels, uh, up to five, or I think there might be six panels. Uh, some of them were. Um, I've never seen these, Michael described them to me, where they were hinged together so that they actually formed a sculpture that you walked around. Um, but uh, recently he was asked to come to Skinner's uh, to help arrange some panels to be photographed for the auction catalogs. Um, so that's what we're seeing here. And Terry, within her own work on them, uh, here we see her in the garage of her house, which she used as a studio. Um, she's only able to view them on the floor. They're meant to be hung, of course, on the wall, uh, but she has to visualize them on the floor. And Michael said that 
she would take them out and hang them on the house in order to photograph them so she'd have slides to send to galleries or museums um, to get her work exhibited. This is another one that they worked out on the floor. Uh, some of these panels are still covered in the plastic that Terry used to protect them. Uh, it's amazing that these things, which are more than 40 years old, uh, for the most part, are still pristine. Um, she you know, was an artist who was very uh, precise about craftsmanship. Um, not only the smooth surfaces and the building of the the panels, you see some, some are not rectangular, um, but also the preservation of the works. Because, as she often said, if anything happens, if there's a stain on this, then the whole work is destroyed. Uh, during this time, she also did some uh, commissions for um, the Catholic Church. Uh, she was always an active member of her faith, uh, at the same time respecting the spiritual journeys that other people had, uh, as diverse as they are. Uh, but she did design some banners. Uh, I'll show you another example. And also, this is for Assumption College. And then for the Marist Chapel at Our Lady's Center in Boston, uh, the Stations of the Cross, which were done in mosaic, with symbols of each, each stage of these stations. She moved from the more sort of black and white uh, works to a series, uh, we have three series, each following each other, that she titled Aurora, Panoply, and Lumen. And that, that series occupied her for almost, oh, those three series, for almost um, a decade. And um, she had gone back to to college, to um, University of Massachusetts in Amherst, uh, to get her degrees, to get a Master of Fine Arts degree particularly. Worked with a man named Arthur Honer, um, who was kind of in sync with her interests in, in color and optical relationships of color. And she did a whole series of works um, emphasizing that or exploring that, as you might say. Notice that these green lines continue vertically from top to bottom. Uh, but when they're affected by the red-orange, they look different than when they are passing through the, uh, the, the blue, the light blue. And then, of course, through the thickness of the line, she gives a sense of maybe space of swelling in the center. So Aurora, um, I'm sure she chose the title because it, it's the time of day that's involved in, in color, you know, the display of beautiful colors and of light. With, you know, you don't see color without light. Um, and then some of her works, of course, give a sense of a glow to them, uh, of, of light actually emanating from them. Now she began silkscreen work in the early 1970s working with a um, local artist, Arthur Masmanian. Uh, there were a number of artists working in silkscreen. Um, she did it for about 10 years. Uh, only in the summer would she work in silkscreen because you're dealing with solvents and inks. Um, eventually realized that these were extremely toxic, that they were causing health problems for many artists. Uh, she <coughs> would work within her studio because it had, she could open the window and had window fans that would, would draw the, um, the fumes away. But it was still quite hazardous to do that. And so she gave it up in 1984 uh, when the you know, medical evidence was out about how dangerous this art, art, artistic process was. Um, the Panoply series is, unlike the Aurora uh, series and the previous uh, static variations and uh, organic interactions. Uh, this is loose again. It's um, the, there's still the lines, but not as rigid, um, perhaps more broken. And then she brings across these curved lines that activate, activate the space. 
But this was actually a very successful series for her. Um, you know, I was involved in the estate after she died. Uh, Michael and I went through what, what remained uh, there. I think there was maybe one, or two of these that were left from that series. Quite beautiful. This, this shows a different color range, though in fact the yellows are, are more intense. So panoply means uh, full display. And uh, she saw it as encompassing everything. This, <laughs> this is the only slide I have of Lumen. They're beautiful shades of a kind of aqua, of blue-green. Uh, that pervade through this, and then uh, there's a kind of, actually this is a fairly hot pink uh, that comes through, um, and then a, um, a really luminous yellow-green. But anyway, um, so this was different from the panoply or from the aurora. Um, you have these sort of fractured sets of stripes that move across the surface, and as they mix with other colors, they begin to appear differently. Now this is a description of another work, but shows kind of the studies that she was doing to create these. She's very much in love with color. And that actually I believe she saw color <clears throat> more vibrantly than most of us do from you know, the way she would talk about it and so forth. Sometimes she would point to a shadow and say, do you see the blues and the violets there? Aren't they beautiful? And I'd look down and see gray or maybe tan or something, you know. And then after a while, I could make myself see blue and violet. But, I, you know, that's sort of the psychological aspect of, of vision as well. If, if, you're, if someone's telling you that it's there, eventually you, you do see it or you believe it. Um, this is one of the prints that she did about the same period of time. In fact, the same period of time. Um, and the screen here is from that print. Um, it doesn't appear to be just like the print because to create a print like this that involves several colors, I guess they're what, well, in addition to the white paper, you have the purple, the blue, two shades of blue, and this, um, this green. So that would involve four screens. Um, so this is simply one of them. She had a Duomo dusk and then a variation which was Duomo dawn. And the Duomo is basically, you know, you can, if you're trying to see something in it other than the abstraction, you can imagine yourself looking up into a dome with the walls extending around you. She had begun teaching at the College of the Holy Cross in 1978. Um, prior to that, um, her marriage with Edward Struckus had uh, dissolved. Uh, her children had gone off on their own. Um, so she was seeing herself kind of in a, a new situation entirely. Um, she starts creating these interiors of these environments. M we're moving now into more recognizable imagery, imagery that in fact depicts something from, you know, from the environmental world. Um, figures do not appear in it. We can imagine ourselves in it, uh, imagine the artist in it. Uh, a lot of them have to do with transition, uh, passages. Um, and I think that's very much because she felt herself in, in transition at that point as well. Around this time, she made her trip to Greece. Oh, here is a, she did a series of these, the empty chairs. Uh, this one, I, I think, is the most poignant of them. Um, and she, she refers to that, about the loneliness uh, that is portrayed by the chairs and how the artist's life is solitary. Now, I know that she would go into the studio. Um, some days it was from 9 o'clock, and she might leave it at 4 with a break for lunch. Uh, this is when she had a full day to, to do that. Um, she would ignore the outside world, let the phone ring, um, not answer the door uh, because she was devoted to her work. She was a very, those of you who know her know she was a very vibrant social person. But when 
inner studio, uh, it was a very private and, and lonely world. Uh, she did a series of works, and actually she started moving into pastel just about the time that she gave up her you know, silkscreen production. Um, so th this is a pastel work. I show a detail of it. Um, actually, the coloring of these shadows really is what I was telling you about the way she would see colors and shadows because there are violets and blues that you see. You know, for example, well, right here you see that, but right across this column is uh, a, a shadow that's quite violet. Um, and archways, um, their number, well, it's like the staircase, the number that involve passageways. So this is Santorini is, of course, the island in the Aegean. Um, she had a wonderful trip there. She was very much entranced by the light and the brilliance of the color. Um, and, of course, uh, the colors within the shadows as well as the highlighted areas. And a couple of silkscreen prints. Uh, this, this was, I think, the last production of her silkscreens. Uh, actually, this is a lithogra lithograph here, a silk screen here. Um, but she uh, had an opportunity to work in one of the most prestigious lithographic uh, studios for artists around Tamarind Studio and produced um, this lithograph there. Then she had this um, fellowship that she got at the Dorland Colony in California. Uh, it's a much desired place for artists to work, not just uh, visual artists, painters and sculptors, uh, but poets uh, and musicians worked there as well. Uh, but it was a kind of environment that she hadn't experienced before. There were snakes around, rodents, um, and then <clears throat> she had already encountered these strange plants in a traveling in Greece, uh, the agaves, and they fascinated her. They were both, you know, interesting sculpturally, but because of their their hardness, their toughness, and their thorniness, they were also um, uh, kind of uh, frightening, maybe a uh, little bit uh, off-putting, maybe not so much frightening, but she became fascinated with this. And I have only this one image, and most of these, I think all of these were pastels that she did of the agaves, and then they moved her into another kind of work. Um, this is not one that you would regard as sensuous, but she was accused of uh, doing these uh, images that were erotic because some of them started to look like breasts with uh, nipples. And uh, she was amused by the fact that people would see them that way. And I reminded her that George O'Keefe was accused of her flowers being very sexual, her flower paintings being very sexual. And O'Keefe said, the, the people who see them that way are talking about themselves. They're not talking about me. <laughs> you know, so. uh, she began this series of prints. This was kind of a troubled time for her. Uh, uh, professionally, she was, um, I guess, having some conflicts with her, her colleagues and um, um, health issues and so forth. Uh, but she moved from the, the more so realistic agaves to these um, these more fanciful um, images in which you have these organic forms that take on a kind of life or being, and they exist within these fantastic landscapes, these dreamlike landscapes. Um, she called them carnivals. The carnivals, of course, can be exciting, amusing, delightful, uh, but they can be frightening as well and risky. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's why she titled this series. This is, a, <clears throat> you know, just like the multi-panels of the Static Variation series, um, she saw these as things that could hang together or apart, and she did the painting on the frames. She has these very colorful borders, whereas the images themselves have color, but it's more restrained color than the, the outer parts. Some These are not large. I would say they're maybe 10 by 10. 
And she incorporated, she started taking colorful wrapping paper and using it as collage. Uh, some of these involve uh, pastel, um, or in this case, it's paint with, this is the collage element, colored wrapping paper. All of this is painted, but you see it as a series of squares with these tendrils sort of extending through them. This looks like fire to me. And here you have, but there are five of these tendrils that play off against these very rigid forms. Then in, um, in the 90s, around 1995, well, 1991, she began um, her collaboration with Alan Fletcher with the Fletcher Priest Gallery. And what had been her studio was turned into the gallery. And for a while, she moved her painting into one of the small bedrooms of her house. Uh, that was constraining um, to quite an extent, but still she, she was able to create. And that's where she began her angel paintings. Um, these were sort of the first works that start appropriating from the past, where she's quoting, you could say like a, a writer quotes uh, an earlier author. Uh, she's quoting earlier artists. Um, in this case, she's in, she was inspired by, I, I don't know if some of you have seen it, at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Every Christmas time, they put up this big tree in their uh, medieval court that has these angels from the 18th century Italian period uh, from Naples. So it's a Neapolitan tree. Here you see the tree and all of these angels. So she would take the photographs of the angels, sometimes turn them around. Um, she'd have them Xerox so that they'd be larger than the original photograph, and then attach them to the painting and repaint, repaint the angel uh, to create the correct light effect and so forth. <clears throat> and about the same time, there was a special exhibition of the work of Tiepolo. Uh, it surprised me that she wanted to see it, but we went to see it together. Normally, when we went to museums, she always wanted to see, you know, the 20th century wing. Uh, but here we're looking at something which I thought never would have interested her before. Um, but with Tiepolo, you have, you know, people, people were able to do things back in the 18th century we can't do now, you know, like floating in the air and that sort of thing. So, um, so uh, Anyway, this was another inspiration for her work. So the angel is always single, you know, individual. Also at this time, uh, she was going through the, the severe illness and loss of her beloved older sister, Emma, um, who died around this, this time. Uh, it was a great blow to Terry. Um, and surely this idea of the celestial realm with angels um, and the possibility of spirits going there was, was on her mind. So always the angel is involved with some sort of uh, cosmic you know, event taking place. And here, this is an intensely dark blue-violet color. Um, and it's showing a solar eclipse although the work is untitled. Uh, but these stars, um, at this point in time, she was going through the prints, the silkscreen prints that she had in her drawers. Uh, some of these had gone out to galleries with the possibility of selling them, and they'd often come back soiled. Or what was worse, if a person pick, picked up the print by one hand, you could get a dent in it. The weight of the print would pull down and create a dent. So, in her mind, that ruined the print. Uh, so she took some of these prints and, and punched out you know, these, these little dots, which she used as the stars. Actually, the dots are different in color, so they, they appear to recede and project more in space than the slide is showing you. Anyway, so she moved on from that um, to the Vermeer series and became fascinated with Vermeer, Jan Vermeer, who was a Dutch artist uh, most of his work dates from about the 1660s. And um, he was not, well, 
there's only 40, about 40 of his works that are known. Of course, one of them um, is the stolen work from the Gardner Museum. Uh, but anyway, she was particularly interested in the women that were portrayed in these uh, interior spaces, always in these interior rooms, and um, <clears throat> began adapting them to new compositions. Now, this one, which is one of the early ones and one of my favorites, incorporates uh, a famous modern work by Marcel Duchamp, who was a da Dada artist. And <clears throat> he, with Duchamp, Duchamp said that the artist does not need to be a craftsman, that it's the idea that matters. Um, you need to come up with a new idea. Well, and you can take, you can take things that are ready-made, things that are, so in a sense, Vermeer, um, <laughs> uh, Terry was taking the Vermeers as ready-mades and incorporating them into new works. So. Here we see um, Duchamp's most famous ready-made, called Bicycle Wheel. Um, it, it works as a work of art because most art is non-functional. So he makes the bicycle wheel non-functional and you can't sit on the stool anymore. Uh, but they <laughs> relate formally to each other because of roundness, you have the roundness, you have the spokes sort of in each one. You know, it's a masterpiece. Anyway, uh, another masterpiece, the allegory of painting. This is the figure, uh, it's out of focus, but this is the figure that <clears throat> Terry took. Now, um, the allegory of pain, painting simply means, well, simply means, uh, it has levels of meaning, but basically you have an artist, and the artist records history. Uh, the woman who stands here with um, a book and a trumpet is the muse of history. Cleo, uh, the muse of history. Uh, so in other words, um, through painting, the artist records her time, uh, his time or her time period. Um, so here we have one, um, Mary Cassatt's letter, um, and then Vermeer's figure. We see her up here. She's <laughs> pregnant woman, here we have a male artist representing a woman who's undoubtedly his wife going through one of her pregnancies. She's reading a letter. Um, this is by a female artist who never married, never had a child. Uh, she chose that direction. Um, so we can you know, get layers of meaning from that. And then what I think is interesting is it's as though the modern woman, 1890s, but modern, um, is giving a message to the earlier woman. In other words, you know, through Terry's work, we're getting new insights into Vermeer. She adds this window. I'm not sure exactly why, but it seems to be the separation that they have in time, uh, yet it's transparent so they can communicate. Okay. Um, when she... She had an exhibit of uh, Vermeer's work, uh, her Vermeer paintings, Vermeer-based paintings, I should say, uh, which was titled Vermeer's Women Making Choices. And this quote pretty much indicates how she felt she was liberating them. Uh, here we see a woman who looks, she's looking at uh, a painting by Alan D'Arcangelo, uh, but it represents a road leading to an unknown place you know, it's offering direction, but you can't see what's on either side. Will she take that road? Um, another example, she enjoyed the relationship that the modern art, you know, here. And <clears throat> the woman looks out at us and engages us. She's playing for us just as this young man is playing for his music teacher who sits in the background. This is called The Music Lesson by Matisse, Henri Matisse. I'm having to move quickly. This is a great one. By the way, the, you know, very little is known about Vermeer's family life. Well, it's known he was an art dealer. It's known that he had a wife and daughters and certainly female help within the household. Uh, but that story about the woman with the pearl earring or the girl with the pearl earring, that's pure fiction. So if you've seen the movie or read the book, um, Hopefully you enjoyed it, but it really 
you know, it really maybe had very little to do with what went on in the household. Here she seems to look towards us as to say, well, what do you think, you know, about... <laughs> but you have a male artist portraying a woman and another male artist portraying, in this case, two women. I think it, in both cases in a very sensitive way. Uh, you hear lots of bad things about Picasso. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there are others who write that he was, you know, I don't know. I won't defend him. Here, I just wanted to show you how close she was able to achieve the comparison. And the same with the Picasso work. This is hers. This is, this is Picasso's. It would be a work from the 1930s, Picasso's. And we have the woman with the pearl earring, but in a very different kind of setting. She did, also did these small fragments. Now, why should, would she do that? Um, she saw things in Vermeer's work which were more than about the subject matter. For example, what is the subject here that's interesting her? It's the luminous window, the way the light is falling in, and then, of course, the, the way it reflects on the silken skirt that the woman wears. Another example, um, it's not a particularly good re reproduction of the Vermeer. It's not too bad of the priest. But here the gesture. The, and this is, again, about choices. The woman holding the balance. Again, the woman is pregnant. In the background is the Last Judgment painting. Uh, it's a woman about making choices, moral choices. And then the big project for... Um, Holy Cross, uh, the College of the Holy Cross, for their new library. This is an immense work. She worked on it at least two years. Um, her, well, her work involved problems with the panels themselves. There are nine panels here. She had a set of them made. She had painted on them. They started to warp. So she had to have a new set made, did some paintings on them, and the paint started to peel because the wood e either wasn't seasoned enough or somehow um, something was leaching through to cause the paint. So finally, the third set worked. Um, it, it is in a cross form because it's the College of the Holy Cross. Uh, it represents the five of the world's great religions, enduring religions, Christianity. Uh, she has a woman writing a letter. Now, if you're familiar with the New Testament, which is the sort of source of Christianity, out of 26 books, 21 of those are letters of apostles writing to um, Christian communities elsewhere. Um, you have the symbols of the four gospel writers in the background, um, this, you know, the pitcher and the, the patent uh, relate to the communion. Uh, this is Judaism. She chooses... Uh, Vermeer's geographer, which makes a lot of sense because the history of Judaism has so much to do with migrations and dislocations of people and relocations, you know, from Egypt to Babylon to Canaan to, you know, to Europe to America to Israel. Um, so he's, of course, reading the Torah uh, for Islam. She has a mosque in the background and uh, in Arabic, the sacred script of Islam, the declaration of the one God and uses Vermeer's woman pouring milk because in Islam, the bread and milk, of course, you know, significant in many religions, but in Islam is seen as very special gifts from, from God. Uh, the two Asian uh, religions, well, of course, yeah, these religions are Asian too in origin, um, but East Asian, uh, Hinduism, the oldest of the five, believing, of course, in a cosmic force that is so unfathomable the human mind can't understand it. It has no name. Uh, it has no form. Uh, but for humanity, it can manifest itself in various forms and names. So this is um, Shiva who dances um, things into and out of existence. So uh, Terry has chosen Vermeer's astronomer, uh, because this is a, a cosmic activity. 
And then for Buddhism, you have the image of Buddha, uh, the um, lotus, which is symbolic of enlightenment, um, the Tibetan mandala, and he, she chooses, she turns the figures around in this case and in this case, um, but she chooses the woman with the balance that we just saw um, because, um, again, it's about decisions, about reality, which path to follow. Here you see the scale of it. Some of you have probably seen it in person. Um, it doesn't show very well, but there's Terry with her two sons, Michael and Joseph, and Terry herself. And slides of the installation with her photograph. She had to photograph through a glass window that was across from the wall that the installation was taking place, so you see her. Whoops. This is one in which she does not include any, it's all Vermeer, but she's turned this figure around and has her reading a letter to the geographer. And having gone to Italy, she saw those altarpieces that have the, you know, the small panels either on either side or underneath. And so she decided to do a version of that, which is quite large and quite complicated. There's modern works in the background of each except for the central panel. And here she has, now, in reviewing this earlier this morning, I realized this quotation deals with another painting. It's not this particular one, but um, very similar. Uh, for the reflection of, the, of Terry within the window, she is standing in our space. She is the artist who has created this and has herself reflected in the glass beyond which is a view of um, O'Keeffe's New York one of New York, uh, O'Keeffe's New York views. Here we see, so it's kind of a, a ghostly image. And so she does say that uh, these female figures from Vermeer became her alter ego. Okay. Now, these, this is the second to the last slide. It's a very long quote, but it's a wonderful one by uh, Roger Hankins from the College of the Holy Cross. I'll give you time to read it. enough time, we can move on. And the last one. This is a wonderful portrait that uh, <clears throat> a member of the staff here at the Worcester Art Museum did uh, of Terry. Uh, he showed up one day, um, rang the doorbell. Michael's told me this story um, unexpectedly and presented her with this portrait. First, she didn't know whether she'd want to really, you know, have something where she's looking at herself, but she did end up hanging it in the bedroom um, really within the last weeks of her life with a magic wand over it. <laughs> it's, it is a great portrait. A good portrait captures, of course, not only the likeness, but the personality, and I think this does it wonderfully well. Well, thank you. All summer, I don't want to be me. I don't want to be my father either. Eleven years in his windowless office, adding and subtracting, wishing and forgetting he could be more. 